published and his three articles about the Turkish War of Independence and the uni Unionist Connection in Publication Progress as of January 2023. And there's a ton of articles you've written and I read a few of them and I couldn't go through all of them, but uh, you've, you've done a lot of great work. So thank, thank you. you so much for coming out tonight. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you for having me. So uh, thank you uh, for coming here tonight. Uh, we were just having this chat with Cam before uh, you arrived. I told him that since uh, my presence in Canada, I have never attended a single lecture of my colleagues. So I don't know how they lecture. I don't, I don't know how they teach. So if you find something which is a little bit uh, inconvenient for you, that's how I roll. Uh, if, if, if to put it correctly, so I'm sorry if it interrupts or if it's against or different than what you are used to in such lectures on of talks. So uh, I'm from Turkey uh, with a Greek origin mother, uh, which is very interesting because Turkey is a land of conflict and Turkey and Greece are always in this unspoken tension. Uh, and I just want to tell you that there's, there has been a recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria approximately 11 days ago, uh, which killed more than 40,000 people. And recently there are maybe more than 30 to 40,000 people already dead under the debris, which could not be uh, dug out yet. And uh, during this time, Turkey and Greece went through a very good partnership era uh, and now uh, the tensions that I mentioned are a little bit less, which is a good thing. But the concept of Turkish War of Independence, uh, as someone who was raised in Turkey and as someone who was educated in Turkey until graduated from university, this was what we called it, Turkish War of Independence. When I went to King's College uh, for my master's degree, my professors told me, so what are you talking about? Are you talking about the Turkish civil war? I said, no, I'm talking about Turkish war of independence. They said, no, it's Turkish civil war. So we had this conflict. We have this discussion with them. So that's when I learned uh, that Turkish war of independence is only known in Turkey and its nearby areas. Other than that, the name given to this specific struggle to this specific conflict is civil war, Turkish Greek war, or sometimes Turkish national struggle. But still I insist to use Turkish war of independence. It's not because it was a war of independence against uh, the occupied, occupying allied forces, but it was a war of independence against the Ottoman Sultan uh, by the Turks. So that's, that, that's an interesting story and we will talk about it. But in order to talk about the actual war, we have to look at its history a little bit. So Ottomans were in First World War. I. They were uh, allies with Germany and Austria-Hungary. And when the war ended, uh, Ottomans had to sign this Armistice, Armistice, Armistice of Mudros in 1918 with the Allies because the Ottoman army was destroyed, uh, because the Ottoman leadership could no longer bear the burden of the war due to economic, financial, and obviously loss of man. So uh, this Armistice has a very interesting article. This is a unique article which you can not see in any kind of armistice or peace agreement. It says <coughs> the allies will have the right to occupy any strategic points within the Ottoman territory if they consider it, if they consider existence of a threat. So this is, I mean, in an armistice, it's usually two, two sides uh, leaving their rifles down, you know, stepping out of the war. But this time, with this article, the allies, namely Britain, France, Italy, and Greece, had the chance and right to occupy any strategic locations they wished within the Ottoman territory, not in Turkey. So there's this misconception of Ottomans and Turkey. So when we look at this map, I, since we are going to talk about Turkish War of Independence, 
this map predominantly shows us modern Turkey. But uh, if you look at it a little bit close, you will see that, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> you will see that there's this part called Syria and Iraq. So Syria and Iraq were among the new nations that were established after the Mudros armistice, after the end of war. In, also, we can add Lebanon, we can add Jordan, we can add Saudi Arabia, we can add Palestine, Israel to this map. So all these land belonged to the Ottomans when the war ended. And according to Mudros armistice, the allies had the right to occupy any part they wished if they considered that there was a threat to their security. So interestingly, <clears throat> of course, in Arab world, in Syria, in Iraq, which are all newly established countries, which had no uh, state structure, which had, which, which had no state institutions, mandate regimes were formed by Britain or France. They established mandate regimes. They said, we are going to rule over you. We are going to teach you how to be a nation state. We are going to build all your institutions and then we are going to leave you alone. They also offered us, offered the same thing, excuse me, to these people who were living in Anatolia. These people were not only the Turkish people. There were Turks living in this part. There were Greeks living here. There were Kurdish people living in this part. Some Armenians living here and Arabs living in this part of the, Turk, of the country. But then uh, since the Syrian and Iraqi leaderships accepted the mandatory regime, the, a leader, a, a, a military uh, commander, a general from Ottoman military, who was sent by the Ottoman Sultan into Anatolia, into this part called Samsun through rear ship, in order to suppress the Turkish insurgencies against the Allied occupation. Because there were some Turkish brigand, brig, brigades, some Turkish groups who were fighting against the Allied occupation. This uh, military leader called Mustafa Kemal, also known as Atatürk, the founder of modern Turkish Republic. Uh, as soon as he stepped into Anatolia, he started an independence movement. He said, well, since uh, we don't want a mandatory regime, and since Sultan who lives in Istanbul, and as you can see, which is occupied by all the allied forces, after the Mudros armistice, including Greece, Britain, France, Italy. Uh, since Sultan is under the control of them, and since people do not want a mandatory regime, and since they are the, you know, the only left loyal uh, citizens of the Ottoman state, I want to start and I want to start initiate an independence movement. Of course, that was not his original idea. The, uh, governments that ruled over Ottoman state, not the Sultan, but the political group called Committee of Union and Progress had already planned such an insurgent, such an independence movement in case the Ottoman territory is occupied by the allies. But Mustafa Kemal was the, let's say, the man who put it into practice. He organized the military, he organized uh, some financial uh, the, uh, facilities, etc. But the as someone who comes from this part of the world, we have I have always been taught that uh, the, the, the the Turkish military, I mean the military under the control of uh, Mustafa Kemal, fought against the British, fought against the French, fought against the Italian. But in fact, when we look at the Turkish War of Independence, which lasted between 1919 and 1922, the Turks and their organized military has only fought against the Greeks. So what happened with the British, Italian and the French? They acted as middlemen most of the time. They were like facilitators. They were 
not trying to get into any conflict. And most of the time, when they uh, confronted the Turkish forces, they just withdrew. They never shot, they never shoot any rifle against each other during the Turkish War of Independence. So that's why I call that that this was a Turk, this was a war of independence, but it was against the uh, Sultan's government in Istanbul and mostly against the Greeks. And of course, there was, there was a little level of conflict in the Eastern part here, especially where Armenians were in control. But eventually at the end of war, when the war of independence ended, a modern Turkish Republic was established and the modern Turkey can be seen with the, uh, these bluish, uh, dark blue corners here. So this is where it ends. So like from this point on, we still have Syria, we have Iraq, etc. But as you can see, all these different nationalities, Kurdish people, Turkish people uh, have fought together in order to gain their independence against the Greeks and then Mustafa Kemal in the capital of modern Turkey, Ankara, fighting mostly against the Ottoman Sultan in Istanbul. That's why it's an independence war, because after all, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, it's, uh, approximately 14 new nation states were established and Turkey is just one of them. So Turkey, according to the literature, since most of the Europeans uh, wanted to call Ottoman Empire as the Turkish Empire, the new modern Turkish Republic is considered as the continuity or continuation of the Ottoman Empire. Of course it is, but it is not the only one. Syria is another one, Iraq is another one, Cyprus is another one, Saudi Arabia is another one, and some Balkan countries are also uh, the nation states that were established after the World War I ended and the Ottoman state was dissolved. So uh, that's why it is called the War of Independence because it was a war against the empire and it was a war against the occupier. So it has two sides. That's why I prefer to call it uh, an a War of Independence. So how did I come up with the Canadians in Turkish War of Independence? Uh, in the last couple of years, I'm working on a, a specific topic, uh, which is the underground organizations in Istanbul formed by the members of uh, the nationalist movement, like the people who support Mustafa Kemal's movement, and how they carried out intelligence activities against the British, French, and other groups within Istanbul, how they smuggled weapons from Istanbul to Anatolia, how they smuggled officials from Istanbul to Anatolia and how they infiltrated the headquarters of allies in Istanbul to learn about their plans. So while I was studying on this topic, uh, I have read maybe more than 300 memoirs of different people who were working in these underground organizations and who are not only Turks actually, some Armenian citizens, some Kurdish students, citizens were also part of these underground organizations. So when I was reading these memoirs, uh, I found out that there was a list of people that they mentioned as the lovely Canadians. All of them, all different, I mean, not in all of them, but at least in 50 to 60 of these memoirs, there are always a reference to Canadians and mostly it's with affection, with compassion, with love. So, and then I decided to follow up who these people were, but my limitation in my research is this. Uh, in Turkish ar archives, you cannot find anything about the uh, British forces who were in Turkey during War of Independence, because most of the Ottoman archives were gone. Two, I cannot go to Turkey. It's because of COVID and other reasons, it's impossible for me to go into archives and do a further research. Other limitation is because the British archives are limited, they only give the names of the Canadians, but in order to track them, uh, I did a very uh, specific research. I tracked all these Canadian soldiers who were in Turkey during Turkish War of Independence and who came, who came back to Canada. Most of them are from Ontario, but they are in little towns, in small towns all around Ontario. So, and, uh, their records are mostly with their families. Some of them have memoirs 
and I'm trying to reach them, but because of, again, because of COVID and because of lack of time and lack of uh, finances, uh, I still cannot get their memoirs and can't get their records, but I was able to get at least three of them. So I'm not going to share them with you today because they are still confidential, but uh, there, are, there were 80 Canadians in total that I know of so far, with, according to British archives, who were in uh, <clears throat> Turkey uh, during the War of Independence. So Canada was a part of British dominion, you know, Canada was a British dominion. So uh, the Canadian expeditionary forces uh, after the First World War ended, most of them returned to Canada, but there were still at least 3,000 Canadian soldiers scattered all around the Middle East. And Turkey was one of them. There were uh, 500 Canadians in Iraq, 500 Canadians in Syria, uh, some Canadians in, in the Arabian Peninsula, some Canadians in Jordan, some in uh, Lebanon, some in Palestine, and 80 of them were in Turkey during the Turkish War of Independence. Because the real peace treaty after the end of war with Turkey and for the future of the Middle East was signed in 1924. The peace treaty, which is called the Lausanne Peace Treaty, which is actually the peace treaty that ends the war between the Ottomans and the Allies was signed in 1924. So until 1924, all these new nation states were being built and there was still a kind of conflict going on in all these regions. So it never ended in 1918. Uh, and these people, these Canadians who were in Turkey, some of them were journalists, but they were all affiliated with military. Some of them were intelligence service members. Some of them were involved in commerce and some of them were involved in missionary activities. So the most famous of these uh, Canadians is Robert Friel. He's very famous because uh, I remember his name when I was uh, 16, 17 years old at university. And our uh, university professor was telling about the intelligence officers of Britain in, in Turkey. So since Canada was a part of British empire, Robert Free was considered as part of the British uh, intelligence. But his real, I mean, his duty was he was a reverend. His public role was the a member being a member of American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission, and he was the president of international congregations, and he was in Turkey since 1912. But when the war ended, uh, when the when, when Istanbul was occupied by the Allies, uh, he became uh, sorry. This is a picture of him. He became the minister of the Evangelical Union Church of Pera in Istanbul, that church still exists. Its name today is Union Church. So he was like a preacher, he was a reverend. But what he did as soon as Istanbul was occupied by the allies, he established something called the Anglophile Society. So this is very important in Turkish history. This is very important in Middle Eastern history because this is the first society established by a group of foreigners and Turks during the occupation that says Britain should come and rule over us like they do in Iraq, like they do in Palestine, like they do in Lebanon. So we want them to establish a, a mandatory regime. We, we are the friends of the Britain, Anglophile society. They had membership cards. They were free to enter anywhere they wished. And Robert Free was one of the two founders of this society. So again, when I was 16, 17 years, years old, my professor at university was telling me about this society and how Robert Friel formed this society. So during my research, uh, again, I said I was working, I'm working on the underground organizations in Turkey. I read a lot about Robert Friel. So my personal interest in his life is now leading me to write a biography about him. So I, I, I wondered what happened to this gentleman after the war ended, after Turkish War of Independence ended, after Turkey became a republic. In 1923, Turkey became a republic. 
1924, Robert Free left Turkey and he was a reverend in uh, Netherlands for three years. Then he went to Denmark for three years in 1930. And then eventually in 1931, he came back to Canada. And then I lost his track. So I don't know which part of Canada he lived. Last thing I know, he left Copenhagen for uh, Canada. But after he arrived in Canada, I don't know what happened to him. So I'm still searching as far as I know, he is from Ontario, but I don't know which part or which city. So I'm searching all the Robert Frews possible, but I contacted all the churches he worked at in Copenhagen, in, 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 in Netherlands. So, and they sent me all the information. So I'm still checking, fact checking his family members and whether I can reach them or not. So he was a very famous guy again, because in the speech, which was written by the founder of Turkish Republic and literally uh, read out loud for 16 hours in 1927. Uh, there was a special reference to letters of one of the members of Anglophile society to Robert Frew. There are, there are like 10 pages that talk about Robert Frew. And again, the Turkish underground intelligence organization copied some letters that were sent from Said Molla to Robert Frew, which included names of collaborators in Anatolia who were pretending to support Mustafa Kemal. And then these people were arrested and spy network established by Frew and Said Molla collapsed. So that was an important part in the speech. So he is very famous in Turkey. He may be, probably he's the only Canadian who is not so much, uh, popular in terms of his role during the uh, war of independence, but still uh, what he did, the impact he left and the church he, he worked in is still an important uh, cultural aspect of Turkish society. And I believe uh, Robert Friel deserves an important place in that sense as a Canadian in Turkish war of independence because of his role and because of uh, his actions. So this is another uh, Canadian who was uh, active in Turkey during Turkish War of Independence, Frederick William McCallum. Uh, he was a reverend, but also he was a doctor and he was working with the military. Uh, he was a part of the nearest relief, uh, which is a missionary group, but he was also in good contact with, uh, with the soldiers. And interestingly, he was in contact with both sides, both the Turkish soldiers and the Canadian soldiers, uh, sorry, excuse me, British and Canadian soldiers. So he facilitating meetings between the Turkish uh, groups and the British soldiers to introduce them to each other and to tell them that there is no need to fight. So in one of the memoirs of a member of Turkish underground organizations, they say, when we met Frederick <coughs> William McCallum, uh, we really enjoyed his way of approaching us. He was friendly. He never judged what we were doing and he helped us. He even let us meet some British and Canadian soldiers and they provided us food. They provided us some logistical support and they said, good luck with your fight against the Greeks. So that's, that's interesting because Britain and Greece were allies and they occupied Turkey together. But then the British soldiers, Canadian soldiers and Frederick William McCollum, for instance, who was like a middleman, they said, good luck in your fight with Greeks to the Turkish soldiers. So that makes him very popular in Turkish society. But of course, uh, only for those who read it. So I'm going, I'm writing a book in Turkish as well, just to introduce these Canadians to Turkish society. So this is an, I, I'm sorry about this quality of this one. This is from the newspaper Globe, which is, uh, which was issued in Canada. Uh, these are the three Canadians who are in Turkey, who were in Turkey in 1920. They are all working for the relief and of course, they were helping predominantly to the Armenians because, you know, after the Armenian genocide, uh, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of work to be done. 
in Turkey because of all the Armenians who were left, uh, Armenian kids, Armenian orphans, Armenian women. So they were helping them and they were mostly doing their work in Istanbul and then in, the, in some parts of Anatolia where Turkish soldiers were fighting against the Greeks and other, other for, to a certain extent to other allied forces, but not a fight, but mostly a struggle. So, and they were the middlemen. They were trying to protect the Armenians they were trying to shelter them in, 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 if they stayed in the middle of the war. And they were also providing shelter for Turkish soldiers. So they were saying, OK, you can come, you can stay here. And then they were protecting the Turkish soldiers from the Greek army because Greek military was uh, more organized. They were stronger. Most of the Turkish soldiers were members of Chetes. Chete means brigands. So they were not organized. They didn't have the weapons or logistics as the Greek army had. So they were just protecting the Turkish soldiers. Uh, and also Canadian soldiers in the meantime, who were on duty in Anatolia, they helped to carry out their duties to the uh, members of relief work. And there were 50 Canadian soldiers in Izmir. I'm going to go back to this map, sorry guys, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is the Greek occupied part of Turkey. This is Izmir. Uh, and yes, it is, it was inhabited by Greeks. Uh, in history, you might know this place as Ionia. Uh, Ephesus, famous cities, Pergamon, all of them are ancient Greek um art civilizations uh buildings so izmir there were a lot of greek people living in this part and then greece sent its forces to occupy this part so when greece did it it was a psychological trigger for majority of the people living in anatolia to join mustafa kemal and his resistance or war of independence because for centuries, Greeks were subject to Turks. I mean, British, French, or Italian, they were Europeans, they were away, but Greeks were subjects to Turks. So how could their subjects come and occupy a part of the land of the country? So that psychological factor really triggered all these millions to fight against the Greek army. And they were, that's the, utmost reason why most of these people joined. So I read it in their memoirs. They said, when the British came, we said nothing. When the French came, we said nothing because we deserved it. Why we joined the war with the Germans. But when the Greeks came, when we learned from our uh, friends in this part of the country that Greeks were occupying, that they were uh, killing the Muslims, the Turks, that's when we decided to join the movement that was started by Mustafa Kemal in most of the memoirs they said. So in Izmir, in this part, British have also sent their men to supervise what the Greeks were doing. Because in the beginning of occupation, a Greek army committed atrocities against the Turks, against the Muslims, mostly the Turks living in this part of the country. So the British have sent their men to supervise what was going on. And interestingly, out of the uh, 200 men sent, 50 of them were Canadian soldiers. Why? Because according to British, Canadians would have a better understanding and they would not be so biased as the British soldiers. Very interesting. And the other 150 soldiers were Indians, uh, Indian Muslims who were also uh, a part of the British military. So these 50 soldiers in Izmir, Canadian soldiers, between 1999 and 1922, uh, acted as reconciliation figures between the Greeks and Turkish army. Uh, all the memoirs I read from the Turks, memoirs I read as far as I can from the Greek soldiers, they all mention Canadians, but they don't mention the names. They say they, come, they came from Canada, they are from Canada, some of them just use their first names like James, like Mark, but we don't know their family names because it's memoirs, it's what those people can 
only remember. So this is, for instance, another Canadian couple. And this lady wrote this book, At the Mercy of Turkish Brigands, but it was actually her memoirs between uh, 1919 and 1921. Then in 1921, they uh, escaped from the hands of Turkish brigands because some Turkish brigands who were not controlled by Mustafa Kemal, who were acting by themselves, they captured or let's say supervised the uh, nearest relief or other uh, relief members for the sake of, you know, maybe they will help the enemy Maybe, maybe they will facilitate the occupation. So they were supervised, or let's say controlled by some Turkish groups. And uh, their memo the memoirs at the mercy of Turkish brigands was found in 1922. Uh, I mean, not found, but that's when it was published in Canada. And it talks about uh, what a Canadian couple experienced during Turkish War of Independence. In a part of this book, DCAB says there were five Canadian soldiers helping us during the crisis. Crisis means Turkish brigands trying to convince them or trying to control them. Private Smith, Mackenzie and James, Colonel McTuck and Captain Haskell, these are the only names and only time the names are mentioned, offered help when we were struggling to find fuel for the cars. They negotiated with the Turkish groups and received fuel and the right to safe passage from the Turkish controlled areas. So these five soldiers, I checked the British archives, found their family names, uh, tried to match them uh, based on the time that they were located in Turkey. Now I, I found some more information about Captain Haskell and Private Mackenzie. They are both from Ontario and their uh, grand grandchildren do help me with their memoirs and the artifacts and everything they had with them. It's very interesting, but again, I cannot share them for confidentiality. As soon as uh, my uh, publisher allows me, I will be happy to share it, but I'm sorry. So uh, one, two other things in which Canadians played an important role in addition to the war, I mean, uh, to this war of independence, one of them is called Chanak Crisis. Actually, this is very important for Canadian history as well. Uh, because in Chanak, when the Turkish military defeated the Greeks, and when they threatened the British army on the eastern side of the Dardanelles at a place called Chanak, Britain requested help from its dominions. But Canada, for the first time, refused to support Britain materially. So in, according to some Canadians, uh, some Canadian historians, it is the first sign of Canadian independence. So it is very interesting because uh, it, is the, it is an important step for Turkey to gain its independence and finally reach Istanbul. But it's also an important sign for Canada to refuse the British demand because Canada joined the League of Nations, Canada said, I, we are going to act as an independent state. Of course, it took a little bit longer, but in 1922, for the first time in its history, Canada refused to send help to the British in this potential crisis. Though this, was, this was also an important thing I just wanted to mention. And finally, this gentleman, Colonel Clayton Kennedy from Canada, who was a colonel, who was a, a, a member of the Air Force during First World War. As soon as the war ended, he was involved in economic and commercial uh, affairs. Uh, he established some companies in Canada, but then uh, he established the Ottoman American Development Company. I mean, this, this company was established by a general, a, a, a soldier called Chester, made, uh, General Chester. But then uh, Kennedy joined this with 50% of its, uh, by taking 50% of the shares. This is so important for the Turkish history. And it's also important for the American attitude towards Turkey. And the, the, the idea of Chester concession was this. 
uh, a company was going to develop railways all around the Turkish land. Uh, and when, the, when Turkey was an independent country, when uh, Lausanne agreement was about to be signed, when the war ended, this part of Iraq was also included to Turkish map. That part of Iraq is Mosul. It is very important because it contains approximately 10% of world's oil reserves. So, and that part was included to the original map of Turkey, the national oath, they called it. They said, this is going to be our land when Mustafa Kemal established the uh, Turkish Grand National Assembly, Turkish Parliament in Ankara. So when the war ended, when the negotiations in Lausanne were going on, uh, Americans wanted to approach Turkey with this company, the Ottoman American Development Company, of which Clayton Kennedy, a Canadian citizen, owned 50% of the shares, and said, we are going to build railway all around Turkey because Turkey was devastated. Turkey had no railways, but you are going to give us concession to use all kinds of minerals, including oil in the region where we built the railways for hundred years. And Turkish parliament said, yes, they were, they were ready to agree. They were ready to sign this, but with the Lausanne agreement, the, the region I just showed you, Mosul was left to Iraq it was no longer a part of Turkey, modern Turkey. So Chester concession was gone. And the second reason why Americans did not want to finalize this concession was because Colonel Clayton Kennedy was not an American, but a Canadian citizen. They said maybe, the, maybe Canadians will get benefit out of it as well. So they just, they, were, they hesitated that in American Senate, there were discussions about Clayton Kennedy, how he, achieved to get 50% of the shares, how, the, how he managed this. He did it very quickly because when the war was going on, nobody believed that Turks would win. So he just gambled and he approached to Chester who was the original uh, person owning this concession. He, he was an American and he said, I'm going to buy your shares from you and he bought it. He gambled and he won. But eventually since Chester concession did not work, uh, Clayton Kennedy became bankrupt. So that's the other Canadian who was an important figure in the history of Turkish War of Independence. So that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or any comments, I'm here. I have a question. Sure. Um, you, one of the, in the newspaper article, uh, it mentioned there was a Canadian. I, in the newspaper article, it mentioned there was a Canadian hospital. Um, could you tell us any more about that? The Canadian hospital? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, there was a Canadian host. There were three Canadian hospitals. Excuse me, I, I forgot. I, I skipped it. There were three Canadian hospitals established in Turkey during Turkish War of Independence, one of them in a place called Gaziantep. Uh, one of them in Istanbul and the other one in Izmir. So all the Canadian missionaries with the help of British and Canadian soldiers have established these hospitals and they brought in uh, all the equipment and medical needs to take care of the people who were wounded during the war or who were suffering because of the war. So these hospitals in 1926, three years after the establishment of Turkish Republic, were uh, transformed into public hospitals by Turkey, but uh, all the equipment and the names of Canadians who first built these hospitals are still written on the walls of these hospitals with like a commemoration to them. So were they staffed by Canadians? And by no, 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 but they were established by Canadians, but they were staffed by Americans, by anyone who worked for the nearest relief or who were doing voluntary work in, in the area as medic, as okay. in medical area. <laughs> uh, so the uh, the Canadian soldiers that were there, are they 
Canadians who were serving with the British military, or are they supposed to be like representing Canada as one of the Allied powers, you know, a token bit in the occupying force? That's a wonderful question because that was a that was a very important misconception at the end of war. When the war ended, the Allied forces that signed the Mudros Armistice were only Britain, France, Italy, and Greece with, with, with the Ottomans. But when it was signed, it was a couple of days, I mean, not a couple of days, a couple of months before the Versailles Treaty in which Canada became, a, I mean, like an independent country as, as a party of the peace treaty. So that was in the middle. So Canada was, did not sign the Mudros Armistice. So that's why most of the soldiers who were deployed into Anatolia were under the uh, flag of British military. Are those in the areas a chunk of Syria and yeah, and Iraq, Iraq on the map that end up coming into Turkey, even though I guess from the original mandate they were assigned to those two countries? Yes. Over and how does that yes. Back? Yes. Thank you for this question. So let me start a little bit earlier. In 1915, when the First World War was going on, the British have uh, exchanged some letters. With, a, with an Arab uh, prominent, uh, with a prominent Arab who was ruling in Arabian Peninsula, not ruling, but let's say controlling the holy cities. His name is Hussein bin Sher Ibn Sherif. So Hussein Ibn Sherif and the British uh, governor in Egypt have exchanged these matters, ma letters, MacMahon, and they promised Hussein Ibn Sherif all the region below this line, including the Arabian Peninsula, including Jordan, including Lebanon, and including Palestine, Israel, to be ruled by the Arabs under his leadership. So while, and that's why the Arab revolt started during the war. The Ottomans really trusted in the Arabs when they were fighting against the British and French, but then suddenly Arab armies revolted against the Ottomans and that's why Ottomans lost these territories so easily. So while Arabs were revolting upon these premises, promises, uh, British and French signed a secret treaty called Sykes-Picot Agreement. And according to this agreement, they literally divided the Middle East. It is called the line in the sand. And they divided the Middle East between themselves. I'm going to control Syria, you are going to control Iraq. And they established these countries uh, in a very artificial way. Iraq, for instance, in Arabic and in Turkish means far away, distant, because it was away from the capital. It was all the way here. It was far away. So, and uh, when they established these nation states, uh, they brought the sons of Hussein as the kings of this space. For instance, Iraqi king, King Faisal, who was the first king of Iraq, was brought by the British and uh, during his enthronement, they played God Save the King because Iraq did not have an anthem because it was not a country at all. So, and in the original Sykes-Picot agreement, when the British and French signed this treaty, this part of Turkey was, I mean, more today's Turkey was a part of France, uh, sorry, Syria. This was a part of Syria because it was largely inhabited by Arabs. So they, they just said, okay, so since Arabs live predominantly in this region, let's add it to Syria. And they also added this part of modern Turkey to Iraq. But then because of the Turkish War of Independence, uh, during the Turkish War of Independence, the Turkish parliament has built, has drawn a map called the National Oath. And according to their map, uh, all these parts were in, in Turkish borders, including Mosul, but then Turkey had to give Mosul because of its importance in oil. So other than Mosul, they kept this part, but originally that was an extension of Syria uh, in Sykes-Picot agreement. Any more questions? Did you come across other, other dominions uh, being mentioned in memoirs, things like that? Kiwis or Australians or? No, uh, Kiwis or Australians were more active during the Gallipoli War mm -hmm. in 1915, uh, which happened here. 
This is Gallipoli. And uh, Kiwis, Australians, some Canadians as well were fighting for British. It was a defense war for Ottomans, but an offense for British and France because uh, Britain and France wanted to pass through the Straits to go and help Russia and the Russian char uh, in, because he was dealing with some economic financial crisis and a revolution was about to happen. It was before the 1917 revolution. It was in 1915. So, and British and French wanted to pass through the Straits and they, uh, they tried to occupy Gallipoli. The war lasted for nine months. During these nine months of time, approximately 5,000 Australian and New Zealand and approximately 300 Canadian soldiers died uh, on the shores. And today in modern Turkey, there is a huge cemetery. Uh, during April, most of, a lot of Australians and New Zealanders come to see their grandfather's graves. Uh, and it's a very sentimental day in the history of Turkey. And every day Turks join them as well. And they mem just memorize those old bad days. But during the war of independence, there is no, uh, reference to any Australians or New Zealanders because they already they were already dispatched back to their homeland after the Gallipoli War because they lost a lot of soldiers and British just decided to send them back. So we, we used a lot of Indian troops as well? Yes, uh, British used Indian troops during the occupation as well, uh, during the Turkish War of Independence because they believed this would have a psychological positive impact because they were Muslims, Turks were Muslims, but it, it didn't work very well for the British because most of these Indian Muslim soldiers actually facilitated the Turkish underground organizations to smuggle weapons from the arms depot that they were protecting. So uh, and, uh, there are a lot of uh, stories about it. And some of the underground organizations have sent some of their members as preachers to the mosques where Indian Muslims were praying during fr Fridays. And they were giving them speeches like, you know, it's the duty of a Muslim to help his brother as the preacher. So they were just easily convinced and they just, just ignored when the uh, Turks came to smuggle the weapons from their depots. And that's one of the most important reasons why Turkish national resistance was successful because at least 500,000 rifles were sent from Istanbul to Anatolia during that time, through ships, through small uh, other other passages, but mostly by uh, small small vessels, they went through here and all the way. Excuse me, all the way to here, Sinop in Ebulu on this part, and then they moved all the way to Ankara the weapons and they distributed to the war. There were British and Greek ships who were, uh, of course, patrolling this area. So that's why most of the people who were smuggling were fishermen. They were dressed like fishermen. So, uh, and, they, and whenever they stopped them, they said, oh, we are just you know, carrying fish. And interestingly, again, uh, some ships that were traveling from Istanbul to this area, Trabzon, like large passenger ships, uh, were owned by, a, by an Ottoman Armenian but he was a member of the underground organization and he was working in the name of a French company. So, and those ships literally passed through the British control zones and the French control zones, because after all, they were carrying, they, were, they had French flags and they also carried at least half of these weapons. Uh, that was another interesting story of Turkish War of Independence in that sense. And some Canadian soldiers, uh, who were uh, patrolling with the British ships are also mentioned in the memoirs of these smugglers, but we don't know their names. Yes. The Soviet Union have a role in any of this? Excuse me? Did the Soviet Union have a role in any of this? The Soviet Union. Yeah, what was their thoughts on it? Were, oh. they, too, were they too engrossed in their own, own issues? Thank you. I mean, Soviet Union considered the Turkish resistance as an opportunity to uh, weaken uh, British, French, and the Italians. Why? Because after all, Soviet Union was trying to uh, start Bolshevik revolutions all around the region, all around Europe as well. 
and they say Turkey would be a good uh, place to, you know, carry out a Bolshevik revolution. So in the beginning of the War of Independence, uh, Soviet Union has approached Ankara to Mustafa Kemal and said, we will provide you weapons and any kind of support you need, but you will promise that you will turn Turkey into a Bolshevik nation. Of, of course, after all, the leader of the revolution, I mean, Mustafa Kemal was a very clever and pragmatic leader. So he said, yes, of course, why not? So he, he received weapons from Soviet Union as well. But when the war ended, Turkey was declared a republic and no Bolshevik revolution happened. But that's the time and hard times needed some hard measures. So that was one of the things. But Soviet Union literally supported Turkey. It's the first country that recognized the national parliament in Ankara as an independent uh, parliament and Turkey as an independent country. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you again for a really fascinating presentation. Thank that was, you. That was incredible. I, I, I learned a lot and I'm sure, I'm sure there's, a, there's a book coming out of this sometime soon. Two books. Two, two books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to that too. Thank you. Um, and there's, I think there's a lot more work to go into it. <laughs> I didn't mention anything about the underground organizations yet. I mean, these are just superficial, but my real area is the underground organizations, but it has nothing to do with Canadians. That's why I didn't want to talk about that. I'm, I'm sure that's a pretty fascinating part of the whole, the whole scheme. Um, just want to mention that uh, any donations we receive tonight are going to uh, the Canadian Red Cross uh, Earthquake Relief Fund in Turkey. Uh, in Syria. Um, and I wanted to mention our next lecture coming up. I'll just get the name. So we have um, on March 23rd, so it's a little later in the month, but we wanted to skip March break. Uh, Emily Oakes, who is a former volunteer at the uh, museum, she's uh, going to speak on, um, it's called We Both Survived, uh, the soldier horse relationship in the First World War. So I think it'll be really interesting and tying in because she, she actually has horses. And so I know she's very passionate about the horses, but uh, I think it'll be a really fascinating talk. And then our last lecture is on April 20th and we have Pardeep Singh Nagra, who's gonna uh, speak on the Sikh military tradition in Canada. Uh, and uh, he's a world renowned speaker and uh, he was a professional boxer one time and he's got a really great story. So I think he'll be really fascinating too. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't keep on his good side. Yeah, keep on his good side. So uh, thank you again for coming and speaking tonight and, and uh, hope everyone drives safely home and thanks for coming up. Thank you very much.